Good afternoon, dear friends. Uh, today we will be continuing with the uh, with the uh, well the subtitles seven three and seven four of our book uh, by Chang and Rain, right? So the seven three is the rules of differentiation involving functions of different variables, derivative of composed functions, chain rule, and inverse function rule. And the 7.4 is about the multivariate functions. Well, the chain rule uh, says so. For z being a function f of y and y being a function uh, g of x, uh, both differentiable, then z uh, can be written as f uh, round g of x or f o, o g of x which is f of g of x of course uh, which means x goes to y with the function g and y goes to z with the function f the function g associates x to y and the function f associates y to z so x is in the domain of g and y is in the domain of f. Those are composed functions. So when we compose f and g, when we obtain the f of g of x, we just show it as fog x, f o g of x, or f round g of x. And this is z. z is the most, um, most composed, most uh, dependent y is the middle variable and x is the most independent variable we think as if x influences y and y influences z so um, the functions f and g have finite derivatives we assume that they have finite derivatives and uh, this is crucial for the proof of this theorem of the chain rule all right uh, what does it mean that they are finite derivatives that their uh, absolute value of their derivatives is less than plus infinity, or their derivatives can, may not be minus infinity or plus infinity, but any number between these two. Uh, it suffices that uh, they don't be, uh, I mean, uh, infinity, plus or minus infinity. They can be as big or as small as you wish, but they should not be plus or minus infinity. These derivatives should be finite. Great. So the rule says the derivative of the composition of these functions f round g of g prime uh, g prime of x is equal to the derivative of f with respect to y times the derivative of g with respect to x. So you just take the derivative of each function according to its own argument and you multiply them and you obtain the derivative of the composed function f round g of x or uh, fog x. So this is the way uh, we obtain the derivative of the composed functions. Or another in, um, in the Leibniz uh, notation, it, we, can, we, can, we can state it as uh, dz over dx uh, equals dz over dy times dy over dx. This is the same thing. All right, let's prove it then. The proof goes, goes like this. Since x goes to y with g and y goes to z with a, uh, f, then a change in x, delta x, a sort of um, measurable uh, finite change in x, delta x, uh, goes to delta y with g and it, it goes to delta z with f. So, I can say, or I can write, delta z over delta x, delta z over delta x, which is the change in the innermost, in the most dependent variable, with respect, with respect to the change in uh, the most uh, independent variable, the dz over dx. This is equal to dz over dy times dy over dx or delta z over delta y times delta y over delta x. Delta x goes to delta y by f, 
by G, I mean, and delta Y goes to delta Z, Z by F. So, so delta Z over delta X is equal to delta Z over delta Y times delta Y over delta X. All these are finite changes. So I can, for instance, simplify delta Ys and obtain delta, delta Z over delta X. So there's nothing wrong about it. Great. And then I use one of our limit theorems. The limit of the product is the product of the limits. And I take the limit of both sides. Since delta Z over delta X is equal to delta Z over delta Y times delta Y over delta X, I take the limit of delta Z over delta X when delta X goes to zero. I just send delta X to zero, meaning that it becomes smaller and smaller. The delta X to change in X becomes smaller and smaller. So limit delta Z over delta X when delta X goes to zero is equal to the uh, since delta Z over delta X is equal to this um, this product, its limit would be equal to the limit of this product as well. So it is limit when delta X goes to zero of delta Z over delta Y times delta Y over delta X. I do nothing but taking the limits of both sides. Very simple. Great. So I will use now this theorem. The limit of the product is the product of the limits. We have already seen this theorem before in the chapter about limits. So, uh, what is it then? It is, I mean, limit delta when delta x goes zero to delta x uh, of delta z over delta y times delta y over delta x is equal to the product of the limits. Limit when delta x goes to zero of delta z over delta y times limit delta when delta x goes zero of delta y over delta x. Great. I just applied the theorem. Great. So, since delta x goes to zero, limit delta z over delta x when delta x goes to zero is the derivative of z with respect to x, dz over dx. This is the definition. Limit of delta y over delta x when delta x goes to zero, it is also by definition the derivative of y with respect to x, dy over dx. Nothing wrong about it. Great. But we have a problem. What is the problem? It is this limit. Limit of delta Z over delta Y when delta X goes to zero. If this were delta Y goes when delta Y goes to zero, we wouldn't have any problem. It would be the, the derivative of Z with respect to Y. But it is not. Delta When delta X goes to zero, it says. So I should be able to show that when delta X goes to zero, delta Y also goes to zero such that this, this limit is equivalent to or is equal to limit delta when delta y goes to zero of delta z or delta y. How can I do it? By using the finiteness of these derivatives. That's why the finiteness of the, these derivatives, especially of the g of x, the derivative of g or g prime of x, is crucial for this proof. So let's see. Um, Yes, here there is the denominator. All right. Uh, we know that g prime of x is dy over dx. This is the limit, the derivative of y with respect to x. It is by definition equal to uh, when delta x goes to zero of limit delta y over delta x. This is the definition. Great. And what do we know about this? Uh, this derivative, we know that it is finite. That is, it is less than plus infinity, greater than minus infinity. It's not infinity. It can be as as big as it wishes, but not infinity. Great. So I can, since this limit is the derivative of y with respect to x, then I can write down g prime of x, which is the derivative of y with respect to x, um, almost equal to, this is not equal to, this is almost equal to, approximately equal to. This is an approximation. So g prime of x is approximately equal to delta y over delta x. It's not equal to delta y over delta x because g prime of x is the limit of delta y over delta x when delta x goes to zero. This is a neat, uh, sort of neat, uh, um, well, neat measure. 
delta y or delta x is a rough measure. But they're almost equal. They're approximately equal. Then I can say, I can write down, I can multiply both sides by delta x. Uh, delta y is approximately equal to g prime of x times delta x. This is what I obtained from this uh, approx approximate equality. Great. Then, I know that the absolute value of g prime of x is uh, less than plus infinity, which is this g prime of x, this derivative, is not infinite. It is finite. As big as it, uh, it may wish to be, no problem. It suffices that it be finite. This is important. So if this is finite, when delta x goes to zero, what does it mean delta x goes to zero? It becomes smaller, 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 and smaller. How big g prime of x should be? Delta x, when it gets smaller, smaller, and smaller well, the, towards zero, after, uh, after a while, it will be less than zero. So, uh, I mean, it will be less than the g prime of x. And it will go to zero. It will be, uh, become smaller and smaller. So, this is crucial. Uh, if this can become smaller and smaller, going to zero, and g prime of x is a finite number, finite value, plus, minus, whatever, but finite, then this product will go to zero as well, which is delta y will go to zero as well. So we have shown that de when delta x goes to zero, that it implies that delta y goes to zero as well. You see, this is crucial. So then I can write down if delta, I mean, when delta x goes to zero, limit delta z over delta y over, I mean, when delta x goes to zero would be equal to the limit when delta y goes to zero of delta z over delta y. And this is equal to the derivative of z with respect to y dz over dy. All right. So let's return to our main equality. We have here limit delta z over delta x is equal to uh, limit delta z over delta y times limit de delta y over delta x. When delta x goes to zero, Limit delta z over uh, del uh, delta y over delta x is the derivative of y with respect to x, dy over dx. Great. Limit delta z over delta x when delta x goes to zero is the derivative of z with respect to x, dz over dx. And I have shown that when delta x goes to zero, delta y goes to zero as well. So um, this interim limit, limit delta x when delta x goes to zero of delta z over delta y is also the derivative of z with respect to y, which is delta z or dz over dy. So what have I obtained? I have obtained dz over dx is equal to dz over dy times dy over dx. And this was what I wanted to show, to prove. Quod erat demonstrandum. But that, that was what we wanted to show in Latin. Great. So the proof is complete. But in general, I can generalize it to more than two functions, more than, more than any, I mean, any, any number of functions. If, for instance, z is equal to f of y, y is equal to g of x, and x is equal to h of w, both differentiable functions with finite derivatives, then dz over dw would be equal to dz over dy times dy over dx times dx over dw, and so on. I can multiply 10 functions like this, no problem. You see, very good proof, very nice proof, and very crucial. This chain rule is perhaps the rule which we use the most in mathematics. We will use it even without saying the name. But for the moment, we, being, we will be using the name. But afterwards, it should get automatical. Otherwise, you will make many errors in, get, in making and getting uh, derivatives. In almost all derivatives, we will need this chain rule. All right, so let's make some examples and show, see its use both in mathematics and in economics as well. So for n being a real number, 
if z is equal to f of x to the power n. Here n should be a little bit higher. Um, this program changes a bit the presentation. The presentation, they are correct. So the um, z is equal to f of x to the power n. So what do we want? We want dz over dx. We want to derive to differentiate z with respect to x, to differentiate the most dependent with respect to the most independent. So what shall we do? f of x is equal to y. f of x is equal to y. So we will first differentiate z with respect to y and differentiate y with respect to x. The, different, the derivative of y with respect to x is f prime of x. It is simple. The de derivative of z with respect to what is in parentheses, which is y, is the, we use the rule, the main rule of derivatives. We just, um, we just put the power in front of the function and reduce the power one. So dz over dx would be equal to n times fx to the power n minus one times f prime of x. You see, this is the application of the chain rule. You know, so we, when there is a parenthesis, we first take the derivative of the, uh, what is outside parenthesis uh, with respect to what is inside parenthesis. And when the, there is another function inside the parenthesis, when it is composed, then we take also the derivative of the function in parentheses with respect to its argument and multiply the two. You see, this is the chain rule. For instance, if z, z is equal to y minus 3 and y is equal to x to the power 3, then we can replace, for instance, y with x to the power 3 and say z is equal to x to the power 3 minus 3. Great. dz over dx, we can take it in both ways. We can either replace y in z uh, here in y, and then take the derivative of z with respect to x, which is 3x squared minus 0, which is 3x squared. But we can also use the chain rule and say dz over dx is equal to dz over dy times dy over dx. What is dz over dy? z y is here, its coefficient is 1, so dz over dy is 1. What is dy over dx? It is 3x to the power 2, so we, when we multiply both, 1 times 3x to the power 2 is 3x to the power 2. You see, we obtain the same result. And this is not, this is not so important, of course. If we can replace y with this value of x, we can, we can also make it. But there are cases where we can't do it. And the chain rule save our life, you see. z is equal to x squared plus 3x minus 2 to the power 17. I wonder who can take and open this equality and take this function and say what it is in as a as a polynomial. But we don't need we don't need to open it. We know the chain rule now. So what shall we do? We just say that this x squared plus 3x minus 2, what is in parentheses is y. We will take the derivative of z with respect to the parentheses, which is y, and then take the what is inside the parentheses, the derivative of what is inside the parentheses, and multiply the two. So y is x squared plus 3x minus 2. z is equal to y to the power 17. So dz over dx is dz over dy times dy over dx. This is the chain rule. What is dz over dy? 17 y to the power 16, dz over dy. And what is dy over dx? That's what the, the derivative of what is inside parentheses, 2x plus 3. So if we multiply 17y to the power 16 by 2x plus 3, we obtain the whole derivative. And we can also replace y with its value, which is x squared plus 3x minus 2. So the whole is 17 times x to the square plus 3x minus 2 to the power 16 times 2x plus 3. You see? Well, this is a mathematical example showing how the chain rule can be useful. Another interesting example is an economic example. We have the total revenue function r equal to f of q. r is the total revenue. q is the quantity produced or sold. And 
are the total revenue is of course when we multiply the price of the good for instance with the quantity we obtain the total revenue of the good we uh, of um, uh, well the total revenue we obtain from selling this good great and we have also a total product function what you, which we call production function what is it it is the function which ties which associates the quantity of the good produced to the factors of production here for simplicity we assume that this Q this quantity of this good is produced only with labor we assume the other factors uh, negligible it doesn't use capital it uses only labor very labor intensive product just an example all right so Q is uh, a function of labor it is G of L R is F of Q and Q is G of L great oh here I uh, just um, I just forgot to put here it should be not way but and and here in that is about if of course um, so those are the our uh, functions so uh, if we use the chain rule to calculate you see L goes to Q and Q goes to R so there is a chain here L goes to Q with G with the function G and Q goes to R with the function F so this is well a chain so we can take the derivative of R with respect to L how can we do it by using the chain rule dz over dx is equal to dz over dy times dy over dx this is the chain rule the rule of the chain rule of course the I mean, the formula then applying saying that z is equal to r here y is equal to q and x is equal to l we can say dr over dl is equal to dr over dq times dq over dl you see so dr over dq is f prime of q dq over dl is g prime of l when we multiply these two we obtain dr over dl so but what are they mathematically it's okay but what, what, what do they mean in economics all these quantities have a meaning very interesting though you see the simplest is G prime of L the derivative of the product of the output with respect to the factor of production L this is the marginal physical product of L what we call the marginal physical product of L the derivative of Q with respect to L and the derivative of R, the total revenue with respect to the quantity produced or sold is the marginal revenue with respect to Q marginal revenue of Q and when we multiply the two we obtain what we call the R over DL marginal revenue product of labor this quantity is called marginal revenue product of labor which is equal to marginal revenue of the quantity produced of the output times marginal physical product of labor and what does it mean let's see whether there is here the uh, just a minute no it doesn't explain what it is I will explain it now so what have we obtained marginal physical physical product of labor is the addition to the output the extra output our last labor hour worker hour for instance produces for us it is a physical quantity like if we produce pens for instance pencils it is so many pencils 100 pens pencils let's call it the last uh, in the last labor hour in the last worker hour the added last worker hour produces for us 100 pencils and what is the revenue that one pencil the last unit of pencil sold gives to me it is the marginal revenue of Q when I multiply them I obtain marginal revenue product of labor which is what the extra the the, the last uh, worker hour 
I used in my production gets to the uh, firm as earning. It is, for instance, Turkish lira or dollars per hour of work, worker hour. You see? And here, if this last worker hour doesn't bring me, I pay this last worker hour uh, an hour wage, isn't it? And a salary. So many Turkish liras, 100 Turkish liras, for instance, per hour. Then, if this amount of pencils produced by this last worker hour, when I sell it, it brings me 110 liras. This is the marginal revenue product of uh, labor. It is okay. It, it be, if we, I pay this labor our 100 Turkish liras and it brings me uh, 110 Turkish lira worth of pencils, I do it. Otherwise, if this last worker hour brings me, say, where it produces pencils and I sell these pencils as a firm and I obtain a, a marginal revenue product. So, uh, if this is 90 Turkish dirhams, for instance, then I will not use this last hour. It brings me less than its salary, the added salary. You see, this is the logic. And there, you can also make, um, um, well, an added value or an, um, um, how can we say it? Um, surplus value, a surplus value theory, not a Marxian but, uh, one, but a neoclassical one, a kind of neoclassical surplus value theory out of these quantities, out of these uh, concepts. Because um, the marginal revenue product, when it is over the wage, hourly wage paid to the, to the, to the labor, then there is a surplus over there, and the surplus goes to the firm. And you can see, you can calculate a, a rate of surplus, surplus uh, uh, value added, value surplus value uh, by the firm. And then uh, you can say, um, you can make a sort of um, an exploitation theory or a surplus value theory. Uh, out of these neoclassical concepts. You see, very, very interesting though. All right, so let's go to um, inverse function rule. Inverse function rule is an application of the chain rule, in fact. We will prove it by chain rule. Uh, I suppose you are uh, somewhat familiar with the inverse functions. The function which brings x to y is a normal straight function. If there is a function which returns y to x, it is the inverse function. So if x goes to y with f, of, uh, the function f, f of x, y is f of x. This is the normal function, the straight function. But if we apply an inverse function, which you show by f to the power, to the power minus 1, it doesn't mean 1 over f, it means inverse function of f. It means the function which brings y to x, which returns y to x. x goes to y with f of x, and y returns to x by f to the power minus 1 of y. The argument of, of, the, the, argument of the, uh, inverse function is not x, it is y. Careful, very careful here. All right. That's to say, if y is equal to f of x, then f minus 1 of y is equal to x, definitely. But there are some conditions. Not all functions have inverse functions. y equals f of x, the primitive function should be, and the straight function should be 1 to 1. What does it mean? 1x should be tied to 1y, and 1y should be tied, should be associated to 1x. 1x cannot be associated to 2y's, then it won't, this 
relationship we will not be a function but one y can be associated to, to more than one axis and then this function is not one to one but only one to one functions have inverse functions the other ones don't have or we can also call them monotonous functions monotonously increasing or monotonously decreasing functions are one to one functions and they have inverse functions otherwise they don't have other functions they don't have inverse functions all right you see uh, if y equals f of x is one to one that's to say if one x is associated to one y and not uh, I mean not more than one x associated to one y in other words if f is monotonously increasing or monotonously decreasing f has an inverse function f to the power minus one inverse functions is shown with this sign this symbol great and its argument is y not x I underlined it uh, let's recall what is monotonously increasing and monotonously decreasing if f is monotonously increasing then for x2 greater than x1 this implies f of x2 greater than f of x1 if f is monotonously decreasing then if x2 is greater than x1 it implies f of x2 less than f of x1 so the function should not change this its slope its derivative the function should be either increasing or decreasing throughout its uh, domain which means the derivative of the function which shows the slope of it should not the, the quantity the sign and the quantity of the slope so it should not change it should remain the same throughout the on the same I mean the, the it should have the same sign it should be positive or negative throughout the uh, whole domain of the function otherwise the function is not monotonous and monotonously increasing or decreasing that is to say it's it won't be one to one then it won't have uh, an inverse function so how shall we determine the monotonicity of the function y equals f of x very simple we just take if it is a differentiable function we just take the derivative and see whether it has the same sign throughout the whole domain of the function very simple all right if the sign of f prime x does not change in the domain of the function f then f is monotonous exactly if in the whole domain of f f prime of x is greater than zero f is monotonously increasing if in the whole domain f prime of x is less than zero f is monotonously decreasing very simple so let's make an let's see an example y is equal to f of x equals 5x plus 25 how shall I know uh, whether this function is monotonous uh, increasing decreasing whatever and then the one to one very simple I just take the derivative what is the derivative of f, f of x f prime of x dy or dx which means 5x the derivative of this is 5 25 is constant this derivative is 0 so 5x plus 25 uh, its derivative is 5 and it is positive everywhere it's a positive constant it's positive everywhere so f is monotonously increasing so there is an inverse function f to the power minus 1 you see so and its inverse function is f to the power minus 1 of y not x because x is equal to f to the power minus 1 of y the inverse function returns y to x the straight function associates x to y it brings x to y but the inverse function returns y to x so f minus 1 of y is equal to x indeed so how shall we do it how shall we obtain it simple we will let x alone usually we solve y in terms of x now we will solve x in terms of y we will obtain x in terms of y how shall we do it with this function simple we have 5x plus 24 5 so we will first uh, add minus 25 to both sides to obtain y minus 25 is equal to 5x plus 25 minus 25 5 25 and minus 25 annihilate each other it is zero so 
uh, y minus 25 is equal to 5x. And then we will multiply both sides with 1 over 5, or we will divide both sides by 5, if, as you wish. Then what we obtain, x is equal to y minus 25 over 5, or if you wish, 1 over 5 times y minus 5. This is the inverse function of f, and its argument is y. It is x equals y minus 25 over 5. This is the inverse function, or 1 over 5 times y minus 5. This is the same thing. Just be careful about it. This is the true inverse function. But if one wishes to show both f minus 1 of y uh, and what is it? y equals f of x. Uh, here it should be f minus 1 of y equals x and y equals f of x on the same graph. Then one can write y equals f minus 1 of x and change x with y and say x minus 25 over 5. Usually in the high school we learn to take the inverse function of a function by first changing, first replacing x by y and then letting y alone, obtaining y in terms of x. This is not correct. This is what we obtain in terms of x. And this is not correct because the, uh, this is not correct because the argument of uh, the inverse function should be y, not x. We should, if we have to draw both the function and the inverse function on the same graph, then we can change, um, we can uh, substitute uh, y by x in the inverse function. Otherwise, the argument of the inverse function is y. It is x, for instance, equals y minus 25 over 5. This is the true inverse function. Great. An economic example, let q equals f of p be the straight demand function. Why I say straight demand function? Because in the economics books, we always use, almost always use, the inverse demand functions, p as a function of q. This is not the demand function. It is the inverse demand function. The true, the straight demand function is q equals f of p. The argument of the straight demand function is p, not q. But we use, in economics books, usually we use p equals f of q. P equals, for instance, mm, I don't know, uh, well, minus 3Q plus 5, something like this. Why do we do it? Because it is the inverse demand function. And because we would like to obtain price in terms of quantity, but the real straight demand function is, is Q equals F of P. You see? So, if everywhere for all P greater than 0, F prime of P is less than 0, which would expect in a normal demand function for a normal good, they should be inversely proportional price and quantity, so f prime of p should be negative normally, if it's not a given good or a, a, a prestige good. All right. So, then f is monotonously increasing. If the, mm, the derivative of this uh, straight demand function with respect to p is negative everywhere, then f is this function is monotonously de decreasing. And it's the, the inverse demand function, p equals f minus 1 of q, which is which, well, what we call also average revenue curve. p is also average revenue. Uh, it exists, and it is, in fact, the um, inverse demand functions we meet in our economics books p as a function of q, you see, but this is not the real demand function, it is the inverse demand function, which we uh, call a little bit slowly uh, the demand function. All right. So, let's see. Uh, what is the derivative of the inverse function? Now, uh, the rule says f minus 1 prime of y and note that we take the derivative of the inverse function with respect to y, not with respect to x. It is dx over dy, not dy over dx. dy over dy over dx is 
the derivative of the straight function, of the primitive function. But the derivative of the inverse function is with respect to y, it is dx over dy. And it is equal to 1 over dy over dx, as one, as one would expect, which is 1 over f prime of x. Very simple, isn't it? The derivative of the inverse function is 1 over the derivative of the function, of the straight function. All right. But we should prove it. This is a rule. We should prove it. And the proof is by chain rule. Very simple. Once we have the chain rule in hand, it is proof is simple. X goes to Y with the function F. Y returns to X with the function F minus 1. Can I compose them? Yes. I can obtain F minus 1 of F of X. If F, uh, if fx is homogeneous, of course. If fx is homogeneous, uh, that's to say, and um, homogeneously increasing or homogeneously decreasing, then it has an inverse function, f minus 1 of y, which is, which is equal to x. Then I can compose f minus 1 with f of x and obtain f minus 1 round f of fx or f minus 1 of f of x is equal to x. Of course, I start by x, goes to y, and then if I compose again f minus 1, then I return to x. So I start by x and I end by x. Great. f minus 1 round f of x is equal to x. Very good. f goes from x to y and f minus 1 goes y to x. Great. What does the chain rule say? It says this composition, the derivative of this composition, f round g of x, the derivative of it, is equal to derivative of f with respect to, um, it should be, um, yes, indeed, the derivative of, this is the general chain rule with f and g. Uh, the derivative of f round g of x is equal to f prime of y times g prime of x. But here, note that f round g of x is x again. If I take the f minus 1 and apply it to f, I return to x. I start by x and I end by x. Great. So f minus 1 round f, the whole prime uh, with respect to x, is by chain rule f minus 1 prime with respect to y, which is the derivative of the inverse function with respect to y, times the derivative of the straight function with respect to x. But what is it? It is the derivative of x by x, which is equal to 1. Or I can write it down like this. Perhaps it would be, it would be more visible. The chain rule is like this. dz over dx is equal to dz over dy times dy over dx. We have seen it and we have proven it before. But here, z is x again y is in the middle and it starts by x and it ends by x so dz over dx instead of dz over dx i have dx over dx z is x so dx over dx which is equal to one is equal to dx over dy times dy over dx you see chain rule but if dx over dy times dy over dx is equal to one then dx over dy is equal to one over dy over dx that's to say the derivative of the inverse function with respect to y is equal to 1 over the derivative of the straight function with respect to x. You see, here we have proven. An example with the previous example, let's see it. y equals f of x equals 5x plus 25. f minus 1 of y is equal to x equal y minus 25 over 5. We have found, found it, or 1 over 5 times y minus 5. So dy over dx the derivative of the straight function is 5. f prime of x is 5. What is dx over dy? This is 1 over the derivative, of, which is f minus 1 prime of y, which is 1 over 5. You see, very easy once you know what to do. Great. Another example where it is a little bit difficult to find the, the inverse function because 
you can say we can first find the inverse function and take this derivative, but sometimes, and in many instances, in fact, it is not so easy to find the inverse function. But we don't have to find it uh, always. We can we can be content with uh, with the derivative of it, and which is easy to calculate. You see here, for instance, y equals f of x equals x to the power five plus x. What is dx over dy, or the inverse, uh, the derivative of the inverse function with respect to x to y? What shall we do? We sh shall first differentiate, take the derivative of the um, of this straight function. This y equals x to the power five plus x. What is its derivative? dy over dx, five x to the power four plus one. We take the usual derivative, five x to the power four plus one. In the real numbers, this is always positive, everywhere. X to the power four is always positive. Five times positive is positive. Plus one is positive. So this cannot be negative. This cannot be zero. This is always positive and greater than zero. Great. So this is a monotonously increasing function, the, uh, the sort of the primitive function. So there is f to the power minus 1, there is its inverse. The inverse of this function exists. But should I calculate it? No. If I need only the derivative of the inverse function, it is easy. What shall I do? I will say dx over dy is equal to 1 over dy over dx. And dy over dx I have already calculated. So it is 1 over 5x to the power 4 plus 1. You can say that, well, its argument should be y. In this case, you can write down instead of x, f to the power minus 1 of y, but we haven't calculated it. And nobody would blame you if you leave it like this, 1 over 5x to the power 4 plus 1, and say that this is the derivative of the inverse function. Nobody would, nobody would blame you. Nobody would say, uh, just replace this x bit with f minus 1 of y. But if we, you are very meticulous, then you can write it down like this as well. But no problem. This is correct. Great. Here you have some um, exercises. You will solve them, of course. And um, I guess you have noted the similarity of the exam questions with the exercises here. So uh, you, should, you, are, you have great advantages in solving these questions, of course, beforehand. Great. So this is our next topic now. Um, seven four multivariate functions and partial derivatives. Now we are getting to a um, quite interesting domain, quite interesting kind of functions, uh, functions with more than one variable, two, three, four variables. So, and partial derivatives. A multivariate function is a function which has more than one arguments. For instance, it has x1 and x2 like uh, arguments and y as the dependent variable. x1 and x2 are independent variables and y is the dependent variable. This is a typical uh, two-variate function, the multivariate function. Uh, these, um, well, this picture, I took it from kanacademy.org, which is a very nice uh, site, internet site. You can find many lessons over there, also in Turkish. It has its Turkish uh, pages, um, which, uh, which sort of, uh, which counts you, which tells you, which gives you lessons and also pictures, small uh, representations, whatever. It's a very good uh, page. I uh, advise it firmly. You can just go to this kanacademy.org and see in Turkish or in English or in any language uh, what they have to tell us. They have many topics, mathematics and other, uh, mostly mathematics, I guess. But it's very good, very nice, very nice drawings as well. So. Uh, I advise you firmly to go there and check this kanacademy.org. Here is a picture from there. Uh, well, we can think of this multivariate function, any multivariate function, uh, intuitively as a mixer or a steam cooker or a meat grinder in which one puts more than one ingredient. 
any function, a univariate function, is like a meat grinder. You know the meat grinder, the butchers use them. Uh, in the supermarkets, you find them as well in the butchery section, in the meat section. You put a piece of meat in it, and you obtain minced meat out of the this machine, this meat grinder. So instead of putting in this machine only meat, but if we put meat, pieces of meat, and um, bread, and eggs, and so on, and some uh, spices, we can obtain, it grinds the whole, and at the, from the other end, we obtain a mixture for making meatballs. And if we put a kind of head on it, we can all even obtain some meatballs uh, already in, in, in the form of balls. So this is a kind of, this kind of machine. You can compare a multivariate function to a, such a meat grinder. You see, univariate function. You put meat from one end, you obtain minced meat from the other end. You put one x, you obtain one y. In the multivariate functions, you put many x's, x1, x2, x3, etc., and you obtain one y on one z, which is a composition of these two, which is the the sort of how can I say, which is the result effect of all these factors. You see, this is the logic of the multivariate function. As a visual image, you can imagine a butter hill like this. You can imagine uh, or sheets, sort of bed sheets, uh, just flying in the sky, in the space, or a, a butter hill a hill or a or, well it can be a hill it can be a, a well it can be a, i don't know any any form but made of butter why is is it made of butter because we will cut it we, we should be able to cut it uh, in pieces in slices or in any direction easily that's why i compare it to a butter hill for instance like this one all right it has an input vector of x, which is which is formed, which is composed of many x's, many variables, x1, x2, x n. Each one shows another particularity, another trait of this phenomenon. Each one is another thing, each, each one represents another trait of this phenomenon. So if they come together, they, mm, they make a vector, an input vector, x. And the output is one y one variable only this one variable y is influenced by all these x's all these factors that's why the input is a vector and the output is one y there are also vector functions where the output is a vector as well but here we don't deal with them the simplest multivariate function is y equals f of x1 x2 you see very simple this one here you see a drawing of y equals f of x1, x2. x1 is one independent variable or one explanatory variable. x2 is the other independent or explanatory variable. And the dependent or explained variable is y at the uh, vertical axis. We draw the uh, explanatory independent variables at the horizontal axis and the dependent or explained variable at the vertical axis. This is a Cartesian coordinate system. And O is the origin, 0, 0, 0, which means x1 is 0, x2 is 0, and y is 0. Then it is origin, 0, 0, 0. You see? It's a bivariate function, two variable with two uh, variable, two independent variables. Uh, you can also augment these, the number of these variables, of course. But, but then it's um, impossible to draw them in a two-dimensional uh, paper or uh, screen, whatever. So, uh, let's, uh, in order to see this partial derivative, we should just uh, start with the definition of partial rate of change. As we have the rate of change, we start the rate with the rate of change, rate of variation for the derivative. With the partial derivative, we should also uh, start with the partial rate of change. What does it mean? It means that we change at each time one of these 
independent variables. For instance, x1 is variable, it changes. x2 remains constant. It doesn't change. It remains at uh, some place, some, some value. x2 is almost, uh, I mean, like constant. Uh, this is the um, uh, this is our famous assumption ceteris paribus. Ceteris paribus means exactly this. The others don't change. Ceteris paribus. The others are the same. Paribus is the same. Ceteris others in Latin. Ceteris paribus. The others remain the same. Remain where they are. They don't change. W what uh, what does it change? It, it changes just uh, the x1 for instance. Only the x1 changes. X2 doesn't change. Or in the second round, x2 changes and x1 doesn't change. This is the logic. So let delta xi different than zero, which means xi, the ith x, for instance, x1 changes, x1 augments or diminishes. But the other x's, for instance, x2 here, doesn't change. It remains where it is. So if we put the uh, initial and the final positions of the function of y. What is the rate of change? It is y1 minus y0 over x1 minus x0. But x1 is not 1 now. It is, it is, it is, it is, there are many x, uh, uh, x's. So, uh, and we, I take, for instance, the first one, x1. Then delta y over delta x1 in the second round, it will be delta y or delta x2, delta y or delta x3, and goes on like this. Uh, here it says, in general, delta y or delta xi. The i'th x changes, the other x's remain constant. Great. Remain where, the, where they are. They don't become zero. Eh? It's not this. They remain where they are. They don't change. But xi changes. It augments or diminishes. It changes positive or negative. This delta xi can be... It, it means the change in x, x1 minus x0 for the i x. And this uh, can be positive or negative, of course. So, delta y over delta xi, which is the partial rate of change, it is f of x1, x2, etc. up to xi minus 1. And then all remains the same. And uh, xi plus 1 to xn remain the same as well. What does it change? It's the delta xi. Xi changes. So xi plus delta xi. Xi1 is xi plus delta xi. Xi, the initial position of xi, plus some change. Delta xi. This is y1, the final position of y, the dependent variable. What is y0? It is f of x1, x2, and xi is at this initial position, xn. This is the initial position of y0, y. So this is y1 minus y0 over x1 minus x0 for the xi. Delta y over delta xi. This is the partial rate of change. And what is partial derivative? Very easy. If I take the limit of this quantity, delta y over delta xi, when delta xi goes to zero, which means it becomes smaller and smaller. And delta xj is zero, which is all the other x's remain constant. Their change is zero. Not they, they are not zero, their change is zero. They don't change. For xj greater than uh, xj is different than xi, or j different than i, different from i. Great. And this is shown by several ways. This is del y over del xi. This, this is pronounced by, by, uh, as del y by, by del xi. This is one way of showing the partial derivative. The uh, longest way, but which is the most excise way of showing it, is dy over dxi, such that, you see, this, uh, this bar means the condition. I put the condition here, dy over dxi, xi, such that dxj is 0 for xj, this, this is different from xi, or j different from i, which means other all the other x's are constant. They remain the same. Ceteris paribus. This is this assumption. And the most brief, the most sort of uh, the shortest way, 
way to show it is f sub i f sub i which is the partial derivative of y y with respect to the i x i variable and the definition is limit delta y over delta x i when delta x i goes to zero when all the other i's uh, j different from i all the x j's remain the same so they don't change their change is zero so this is it is the limit of the rate of change of the function with respect to a variable when this variable only changes while the others remains constant and the change in this very variable goes to zero delta x i goes to zero all the r other x j's remain constant this is the definition of the partial derivative so it is the derivative in fact it's not nothing else but the derivative of a function with respect to the to the variable one two three whatever variable while the other variables remain constant and when we take the derivatives the all the derivative formula will be the same we will use the same formula but uh, we will when we take the the derivative of for instance f of um, with respect to x1 x2 x3 x how, how many x is x10 whatever all the other x's we will consider them as constant as if they were numbers constant numbers and treat them accordingly if they are coefficients they would be constant coefficients if they are i don't know powers they will be constant powers you see we will treat them as constant numbers all the other variables there will be at, at each round there will be one variable which is really variable the others will remain constant so this is the meaning of partial ceteris paribus means all right so partial differentiation techniques how do we make the partial differentiation uh, not so uh, difficult we should be a uh, yeah, we should make some exercises of course it's not very obvious at the first glance but one gets accustomed to it afterwards it is the derivative it's nothing else but the derivative but we should be careful about what is constant what is variable the principle is this the variables which don't change are taken as constants and the derivatives are taken accordingly as I said the derivative formula remain the same the setter is part of this assumption in the economics exactly so the example y equals f of x1 x2 is equal to 3 x1 to the power 2 plus x1 times x2 plus 4 x2 square or 4 x2 to the power 2 this is a bivariate polynomial with two variables x1 and x2 so i will take the first take the variable uh, the the different derivative of y with respect to x1 the partial derivative of y with respect to x1 and then I will take the de partial derivative of y with respect to x2 when I take the partial derivative of y with respect to x1 I will treat x2 as constant and when I take the derivative of y with respect to x2 I will treat x1 as constant so let's see together del y over del x1 so with respect to which variable uh, am I taking the derivative x1 what shall remain constant x2 great the first thing to 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 sort of to remember to recall to observe I will take x1 variable x2 constant so 3 x1 square if this is a variable I just put 2 in front of this 2 times 3 is 6 x1 and I just reduce by one the power so it will be x1 to the power 1 which is x1 so this is 6 x1 plus x1 times x2 what is x2 it is constant don't forget if it were 3 for instance the constant 3 3 x1 what is the derivative of 3 x1 it is 3 so what is the derivative of x1 by x2 with respect to x1 it is x2 and plus 4x2 square is there x1 here no so what is it it is the whole is constant the derivative of the constant is zero so we should have written perhaps 
six x one plus x two plus zero, but since it is zero, it's not written. So the all in all, you see del y over del x one, the derivative of y, the partial derivative of y with respect to x one is six x one plus x two. Now let's take the derivative of y with respect to x two. Then who is constant? X one. X one will remain constant. Who is variable? X two. Great. So del y over del x two is 3x1 square. Is there x2 here? No. So the whole is constant. Its derivative is 0. Plus x1 times x2 with respect to x2 is x1. Plus 4x2 to the power 2. I just put 2 in front and reduce by 1. So 2 times 4 is 8x2 to the power 1, 8x2. Uh, so the whole is x1 plus 8x2. You see, del y over del x2, or f2 is x1 plus 8x2. If I want their values in some definite points, for instance, the point 1, 3, where the coordinate x1 is 1 and the coordinate x2 is 3, then I just take the derivatives analytically and then replace the x1 and x2 with these numbers. So here is 6 times 1 plus 3. 6 plus 3, 9. Here, uh, 1 plus 8 times 3, 8 times 3, 24 plus 1, 25. You see, very easy. All right. Uh, another example. Y is equal to f of uh, u, v. Now the variables are not x1, x2, but u and v. So um, y is equal to f of u, v is, is equal to u plus 4 times 3u plus 2v. This is a product. So we will use the formula of the product limit, of course. What is it? The, um, the formula, not of the product limit, of the derivative. The, the product derivative, of course. Here I wrote product limit, but it should be product derivative, the derivative of the product, of course. What is it? The derivative of the first one by the second one, plus the, der the, the first one by the derivative of the second one. The usual formula. This is not the product limit. The um, the product derivative or the formula of the derivative of the product. I will correct it before sending you the uh, presentation. All right. So what is del y over del u, which is f of u, f sub u, if you wish. So the derivative of the first one with respect to u, it is one plus zero. 4 is constant, so its derivative is 0. You, the derivative of u with respect to u is 1, 1 plus 0. Times the primitive of the second one, 3u plus 2v. Plus the primitive of the first factor, first factor, which is u plus 4, 4, times the derivative of the second factor, which is 3u plus 2v. What is the derivative of 3u by u is 3. In 2v, we don't have u. This is constant, its derivative is 0 with respect to u. So 3 plus 0. So here is 1 plus 0 is 1. So times 3u plus 2v is 3u plus 2v. 3 plus 0 is 3. 3 times u plus 3 times 4 is 3u plus 12. All in all, obtain 6u plus 2v plus 12. Or if you wish, 2 times 3u plus v plus 6, which is not necessary. You can just leave it like this as well. And this is the result of this derivation. What is del y over del v, or f of v? This time, we will hold u constant. We will use the same product derivative formula, and holding u constant and v as variable. Well, what is the primitive function? u plus 4 times 3u plus 2v. Is there v in u plus 4? No. So the derivative of u plus 4 is 0 times this one. 0 plus 0 times 3u plus 2v. Plus u plus 4. Is there v in it? No. So this is a constant. I will just take u plus 4 as a constant plus, times the derivative of this one with respect to v. In 3u, there is no v, so its derivative is 0. And the derivative of 2v is 2. So this is the result. 0 times this disappears, 0. And here, 2 times u plus 2 times 4, 2u plus 8, or 2 times u plus 4, as you wish. And if we want 
definite values at a point, then we give the coordinates of these points and put them in these analytic derivatives and obtain the results. For instance, here it is 6u plus 2v plus 12, and uh, the point is 2, 1, uh, which means u is 2, v is 1, so 6 times 2 plus 2 times 1 plus 12. 12 plus 12, uh, 24, plus 2, 26, yes. And mm, f of v is 2 times u, 2 times 2, plus 8 is 8 plus 4, 12. You see, very easy. Another example, uh, with the formula of the quotient derivative, not the limit, but the, the derivative, of course, this limit is not true, it is derivative of the quotient. So here we have, uh, the example y is equal to f of uv equal to 3u minus 2v over u squared plus 3v. What is the formula? The derivative of the numerator by the primitive of the denominator minus the numerator times the de derivative of the denominator, the whole over the denominator square. This is the formula of the a quotient derivative, the derivative of the quotient we have seen before. So I will apply it, but just careful. First, we derive y with respect to, or we differentiate y with respect to u, and then in the second dot with respect to v. What does it mean? We will hold u as variable and v as constant in the first round. And the second round, we will hold u as constant and v as variable, and take the derivatives accordingly. Great. So, first del y over del u, or f sub u. What is it? I will take the derivative of this one with respect to u. What is it? 3 minus 0. In 2 v, there is no u, so 0. 3 minus 0, which is 3. Times u square, u square plus 3 v, the denominator itself. Minus the numerator itself, 3 u minus 2 v times the derivative of this one with respect to u. What is it? u squared. The derivative of this is 2u plus 3v. In 3v, there's no u. Its derivative is 0. So 2u plus 0. And the whole divided by the denominator squared. u squared plus 3v in square. Great. We don't have to develop it. We just uh, develop the numerator. So 3 times u squared plus 3v uh, minus, here there is 0, minus 3 times 6, 6u six square, 3u square minus 6u square minus 3u square, um, plus 9v, yes, and minus 4uv, minus, minus 2 times minus, plus 4uv. So we all, in all we obtain minus 3u square plus 4uv plus 9v, the whole over u square plus 3v, the whole squared. When we derive y with respect to v, then f sub v, del y or del v, whichever you wish. So now I take the derivative of the numerator with respect to v. In 3, there is no v, its derivative is 0. Minus 2v, its derivative is minus 2, 0 minus 2, times the denominator, u squared plus 3v, minus the numerator itself, 3u minus 2v, times the derivative of the denominator with respect to v this time, 0 plus 3. Yes. And the whole divided by u squared plus 3v to the square. Great. 0 minus 2, 2 minus 2, minus 2u squared minus 6v, minus 9u, minus minus plus 6v. So what is it? Minus 6v and plus 6v, they annihilate each other, they disappear. So I have minus 2u squared plus minus 9u. The whole divided by u squared plus 3v squared. So this is the result. If I have numbers for u and v coordinates, then I can replace and find numeric values as well. Great. Now, what does all these things mean? in economics or elsewhere? What is the geometry and the economics of all these things? What we have spoken about, all these partial derivatives. Geometric and economic interpretation of partial derivatives. This is the crucial point of this lesson, indeed. So, 
Um, well, we have the production function. Let's see it on a production function. A production function, a total product function, total physical product function, if you wish. The whole name is this total physical product function. One thing to recall is that the derivative in mathematics is marginal in economics. In economics, we call the derivatives with the concept marginal, with the term marginal, marginal product. What is it? It is the derivative of the total product with respect to a factor of production. This is marginal product of labor, of capital, of energy, whatever you wish, whatever factor you have in that. So, so, all right. How, I mean, what does it look like, this uh, production function, total product function? It looks like this, more or less, like a hill. You have the capital, labor. It's very simplified, a very simplified model. Why? Because all the accumulable factors are uh, sort of summarized under the name of capital. And all the non-accumulable factors are summarized under the name of labor. That's why this model is so simple. Otherwise, we don't use only labor and capital. We use many other factors of production as well, and like energy, like the, some, the, well, uh, intermediate goods, whatever, whatever. You see? But we collect all the accumulable factors under the name of capital as an index and all the non-accumulable factors on the name of labor as an index. That's why this model is so simple. And the total product, which is the output when we put in the machine, the factory, capital and labor, capital are the machines and labor is the, uh, capital is the machine hour and labor is the man hour, is the worker hour. Like the energy in kilowatt hours. It's the same concept, you see. So, um, and when we put these inputs into the factory, then we obtain this surface of production. This is the production function, total product function, total physical product function. This is the surface, like a hill. And it has also these uh, isoquants, which are the iso, uh, like the iso hips in the, ge in the geography, like the um the the locus of points with the same height and here they show the locus of points with the same output level 1000 pence pencils for instance in a day this is the this is the locus of the uh, capital labor compositions which give me 1000 pencils in a day. I can use a little more capital, a little bit less labor, or I can use a little more labor, less capital, but obtain 1,000 pencils. So this is the ISO quant, the same quantity. ISO, ISO is, is the same, the same quantity, you see? And the whole surface is the total product. It shows me capital labor compositions giving a given number of pencils, for instance. This is the whole surface, total physical product function, which we call output function or product production function. Q is the output, K is the capital, L is labor, like we are used to in the economics books. So, uh, isoquants, I explained what they are. So, let's see a bit. The derivative, what is the derivative? In geometry, it is the slope of a curve at a given point. Like here, for instance, you have small slopes here. You see, the you have a point and the tangent line passing by that point, and the um, the slope of this tangent line shown by this here. I showed them with these small triangles. What do we take? We do take the um, well, the tangent of this angle here, which is the uh, opposite side by the adjacent side, you obtain the tangent. And the tangent is the slope of this uh, 
the slope of this line, tangent line passing by that point, and its value, its, its uh, measure, it's a derivative of this function at that point. So, but what is here, we speak of partial derivatives. So, the total physical product function TPP or Q is QKL, this surface, the, so the whole surface of the hill. Q is here on the vertical axis. Here in, in our book, there is a mistake. It has shown Q here, but if you, sh if you sh draw Q here and not here, and you put the origin here, everything is negative. But we don't use negative capitals and negative labors. We use positive capitals and positive labor quantities. And we obtain a positive output, usually. Uh, I haven't seen any negative apples, uh, apples or pears up to now, or, apple, uh, or negative oranges, so or negative pencils. That's why, I mean, the, the, we use, uh, usually, the positive quanti quantities. If it is not a good, but a, but a bad, in the, uh, well, in the master's or doctorate PhD level, then you can speak of the, uh, of some uh, inclination, some, some uh, pollution. Then, uh, if it is a bad, then you can take it as a negative measure. But for the moment being, for pears and apples or oranges or pencils, they can't be negative. So everything, everything and capital and labor can't be negative. Everything should be positive. We should use the first quadrant. So Q, uh, the axis, the vertical axis should be here and the origin should be here. So be, please correct it in your books. This is the correct picture. All right. So... Um, Great. So what should we, shall we do? We have the total physical product, which is QKL surface, the surface of this hill, which is the total physical product function, which we call production or output function, which we are used to. So if we fix the capital constant at the value K equals K0, for instance, here, what do we do? We just cut this surface as if we were we are cutting it it with a for instance um, with a doner kebab knife with a big doner kebab knife the sword we cut it and we take the section of this surface this section this is what we do in geometry actually when we take the partial derivative first before taking the derivative we take the partial function partial total function total physical product of labor. What is the total physical product of labor? It is Q of K0L. What does it mean? I fix the capital at the value K0, at the level K0, ceteris paribus, I fix K0, and I change L, labor. Then the labor moves along the labor axis, which is here as well. But the K is fixed at K0. You see what I mean by taking it constant, what I mean by ceteris paribus. The others are constant, which means I fix K at K0, and I move L. And here, I, in this case, I take only this section of this production function, and I play on this section. This is the total physical product of labor. If I, on the contrary, or not on the contrary, but complement, it's a complement. If I take L0 is constant, L is constant at the value L0, and let K move be variable along K axis, along the capital axis, then it means I cut this surface in this direction now. I take this section with this Döner kebab uh, knife or uh, sword. Then I take this section and I play on it. This is total physical product of capital. This section, this section of the service, this curve is total physical product of capital. This curve is total physical product of labor and both are functions. Note that they are functions. What shall I do for obtaining the marginal physical product of labor? I take the derivative of this function 
fixed at k equals k0 and I let L move alongside the L axis. I take the derivative of this function, of this curve, at any point I wish. If I want the derivative of this curve at L1, I take this the slope of this tangent. If I want the derivative of this curve at L2, I take the slope of uh, this line, which is the tangent of this small thing, which is the derivative of this uh, which is the partial derivative of Q with respect to L at this point L2. And this is the slope of the tangent line passing by this point on this curve only. You see, marginal physical product of labor is equal by definition to del L, del Q or del L, or Q of L if you wish. It is, by definition, it is limit of delta Q over delta L when delta L goes to zero. This is the definition of the derivative. Subject to delta K is equal to zero or K equals K zero, which means ceteris paribus. The other one, which is capital, is constant. I take the derivative of Q, of the production function, with respect to L, holding K constant. This is this these derivatives you see here and if I want to take the marginal physical product of labor then um, of capital I mean then I hold labor constant at L0 for instance so it's at some value here if I take L, uh, the labor constant at L0 then I take this curve this curve of the surface of the whole function it is the total physical product of capital this one because I hold L0 constant L constant I and I ch let capital change so this is the total physical product of capital and if I take the derivative of this at any point here for instance then uh, I obtain the marginal physical product of cap capital at that point you see so marginal physical product of capital is by definition del Q or del K or Q of K or in general limit of delta Q over delta K when delta K goes to zero subject to delta L equals zero or L equals L zero. Here it uh, shifted a little bit, the program shifted a little bit, um, the presentation is correct. You don't see it in here, uh, there's the same condition with L here. And last and last thing for your general culture now we will not use it now but sometimes you can you can cross it in your studies the gradient vector the gradient vector of a multivariate function y equals f of x1 to xn it is shown by a inverse triangle this is the sign of the gradient the an inverse delta in fact this is the gradient or grad f you can take this inverse delta f or grad f which is which means the gradient vector of f which is the vector of the partial derivatives of f of this function with the given order of variables so f sub 1 f sub 2 f sub n all these um, partial derivatives if you make a vector out of them without changing the number of the variables. This is called the gradient vector. For instance, the gradient of Q K L, the gradient of the production function, is the marginal product of capital and marginal product of labor. It's a, a vector of two elements, marginal product of capital, marginal product of Q K and Q L. You see Q sub K and Q sub L. This is the gradient of the production function. You can cross it somewhere. This this vector exists. It is used in economics. It is the vector of the partial derivatives. This is the gradient vector. And you have, all, of course, the exercises. You should solve them. Uh, look at, uh, first solve them. Look at the solutions at the end of the book. And on the, in the book of uh, solutions, I gave, sort of, I gave you, I sent you or it is on our page as well, I guess. So, uh, and if there are any questions uh, which you might have, uh, I mean, for the lesson or for, uh, about the questions, about the problems, 
don't hesitate to contact me. You have my phone number, my email, whatever you wish. So I wish you luck and um, good continuation. I will correct your um, your exams, your midterms, and give you marks. Thank you very much for today.